Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Wal aqibat lil muttaqin. Wal a'udwana illa ala al-dalimin. Wa ashadu an la ilaha illa Allah wahdahu la sharika lah. Wa ashadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluh. Sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa ashabihi wa man da'a bi da'watihi wa stanna bi sunnatihi ila yawm al-deen wa sallam tasliman kathiran Amma ba'd All praises are due to Allah, Lord of the worlds And surely the best reward is for those who have taqwa And surely there is no animosity except for the oppressor and I bear witness that Allah is one and has no partners. That Muhammad the son of Abdullah is his servant and his last messenger. And may Allah always and constantly send peace and blessings to Muhammad. And to his family and his companions. And all those who call to his way and establish his sunnah to the day of judgment. As to what follows when the armies of Islam had conquered the Mediterranean islands it was a great day of cheer the Muslims were joyous Allah had given them victory in a place that they never thought that they would reach and as the armies moved around in happiness they found one of the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Abu Darda radiallahu an they found him bitterly crying baka buka an murra and they came to him and they said ya Abu Darda why are you crying Allah has given us victory Allah has opened up these lands and he answered them these people have disobeyed Allah and he has given us authority over them and I fear the day would come when we would disobey Allah and He would give them authority over us. Sadaqta ya Abu Darda radiallahu anq This day has surely arrived. O you who believe, Muslims are at the crossroads. And in few times in history, have there been such contradictions in front of us? Such a vast ummah, so much potential, so many young, prepared, strong men, intelligent, strong women, but yet such defeat on the ground, confusion, humiliation. And although the ummah is rising, for many people who don't necessarily have that full perspective to realize that we are coming up we're coming out of a low point in our cycle for many people it's hard to deal with this contradiction and so we need to have an honest analysis and we need to speak to each other in sincerity and so I want to speak to you tonight not as a great scholar of Islam not as a movement leader, not as a mufti, but as a brother who has been in the field for 20 years and has seen, lived with the, with the problems of the Muslims. And looking at history and seeing the condition Muslims are in today, I seek refuge in the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when He tells us, A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytani rajeem Ya ayyuha alladhina amunu attaqu allaha wa kulu qawlan sadeeda Yuslih lakum a'malakum wa yaghfi lakum dhunubakum Wa man yuti illaha wa rasoolahu faqad faza fawzan azeema O you who believe have the consciousness of Allah and speak a straightforward word He would repair your deeds and forgive you of your sins And whoever obeys Allah and his messenger has surely gained a mighty triumph. And so I speak to you tonight not just from the mind but from the heart. And we need to speak to each other as brothers and sisters 
as people in the same family and to speak about our Islam from the ground up and not necessarily from the high echelons from the ivory towers and then we look down on the people because the Muslim masses <coughs> the majority of the Muslims are looking for a savior and there's a strange phenomenon that is going on today that in some cases we find Muslims victorious on the ground we see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opening up victories for them in these times but the question is now and, we will all may, and all of us may have to face this what is after the victory ma ba'd al fath after the enemy has been defeated and we have to deal with ourselves then the real war has begun and so despite the fact that the western press and the history books have targeted muslims as the new enemy and are trying to make a clash with us in a clash of civilizations despite the fact that they have focused on muslim women as one of the groups <coughs> and have attacked the wearing of the hijab despite this fact i believe strongly that we have to look inside of ourselves allah tells us inna allaha la yughayyiru ma bi qawmin hatta yughayyiru ma bi anfusihim allah will not change the condition of a people until they change that which is in themselves and so we reflect tonight as we have in the last few days and the theme that we are constantly hearing change ourselves what we are constantly hearing that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us a'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajim ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu taqullaha wa tanzu nafsun ma qaddamat li ghad wa taqullaha inna allaha khabirun bima ta'malun wa la takunu kal ladhina nasu allaha fa ansahum anfusahum ulaika humul fasiqun o you who believe have the consciousness of allah and let every soul look to what it has put forward for tomorrow and fear allah surely allah is well aware of all that you do and be not as those who forgot allah and so he made them forget themselves surely they are the disobedient ones they forgot allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allah gave them victory allah gave them authority over the weak in their own families in their own community and they forgot their responsibility and so the victory although it was sweet could actually turn bitter and so we need to look at some of our internal practices and i want tonight to open up one of the veils and to go behind the veil of our homes into our private life into the very relationship between the men and the women of Islam because the home is the base of Islam and if we do not have strong homes that support the masjid the central part of our, our community then we have no future if the home is not strong the children won't be strong if the children are not strong we don't have leadership for the future and so we need to be honest with ourselves and open with ourselves we forgot allah i was traveling in one of the muslim countries i won't say which one it is and i was traveling with brothers and we came by some madrasas madaras islamia so alhamdulillah the young people are learning to read the quran they are learning tafsir they are learning hadith who is studying in these schools and they said the boys and i said is there a school for the girls they said no 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 brother abdullah the more knowledge they get is the more problem you have so they said to me i said wait a minute 
What religion is this? What are you talking about? When what I understood is that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu He is talking to male and female. He's not only talking to males. So any uh, ayah, any hadith, which is directed to the believers as a jama'ah is directed to male and female. And when the Prophet ﷺ has told us, Talib al farida ala kulli Muslim, that seeking knowledge is farad, it is compulsory on all Muslims, then that includes females. <coughs> what religion is this? I recall the fact that Aisha radiallahu anha reported. A number of hadith. And that if we look into our Islamic traditions and we go to the books of hadith, then after a short time you will come to her name as one of the reporters. The second most hadith, 2,210 hadith reported by a woman. And she also became one of the leading scholars at the time. Even great Sahaba would come to her for information and analysis. I also recalled that <coughs> according to Ash-Shalabi, Nafisa, a descendant of Ali radiallahu an, was such a great authority of traditions that Imam al-Shafi'i learned from her in Al-Fustat at the height of his fame. And that Karima bin Ahmed al-Marwazi was a transmitter and interpreter for Sahih al-Bukhari. One of her pupils, a person who learned from her, was Al-Khatib al-Baghdadi. Rahimahullah. I also recalled that Ibn Asakir, a famous hadith transmitter, had over 80 women, 8 O, amongst his highest regarded scholars. And that Imam al-Suyuti, and that many of the great imma of Islam, would put women in their silsila, in their chain of knowledge, as a person who they would refer to for those who were above them in knowledge of hadith, or knowledge of tafsir. And that Fatima bin Malik ibn Anas, may Allah have mercy on them both, was a famous student of al muwatta And you can go on and on and list the women who have made valuable contributions to Islamic education. Islam empowers people. It empowered the first generation. It empowered the second generation. It empowered the third generation. It empowered the great scholars of Islam. How now could we be disempowering people in the name of Islam? We forgot Allah. In one Muslim country, and I am reporting to you directly from the community that I was involved in before, the testimony from the women of this nation, and I won't say which nation, so one is against the other, but in this live true report, the women said, we were taught that you cannot enter paradise unless you get a beaten by your husband. You can't enter paradise. Which religion is this? What sunnah are you talking about? When the Prophet ﷺ, it is recorded, never struck any of his wives. You want to do sunnah? Like you do sunnah rakats? You want to be sunnah like you tie your imama? The Prophet ﷺ never struck any of his wives. That's a sunnah. But yet, we find something else. The Prophet peace be upon him also said إِنَّمَا nisa شَقَائِقَ الرِّجَالِ That women are the blood relations of the men. The shaqiqa. This is not just somebody who has a, a relation but a close relation. So how could you be humiliating and beating and striking somebody who is a close relation of you? How can it be done? How in the name of Islam could a woman be struck by a man who claims he fears Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Viciously struck. And yes, there is. 
There's no doubt about it in Surah An-Nisa, as we know. There is a verse, number 34, that allows permission for a light tap to be given to a woman who is disobedient after counseling her, warning her, leaving the bed, calling in uh, uh, counselors on both sides, then a light tap is allowed. But how many, how many men in their rage can actually give a woman a light tap? I want to deal with reality now, brothers. And I'm talking to myself. How many can actually give a light tap? Like a, a, a handkerchief or a miswack. <laughs> Most of the brothers, they get, and they're coming in like Mike Tyson. <laughs> this is far from Islam. And Allah tells us, never forget, لا تكونوا كالذين نسوا الله فأنساهم أنفسهم And I fear one saying of the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him. And I wondered how could the enemies of Allah, swine eaters, defeat Muslims who had died. What is happening to them? What is behind them? What do are is against them? The Prophet ﷺ said, اِتَّقُوا دَعْوَةُ الْمَظْلُومِ فَلَيْسَ بَيْنَهَا وَبَيْنَ اللَّهِ حِجَاب Be, Beware! of the dua, of the prayer of the oppressed person. There is no barrier in between that dua and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so if that woman is humiliated, if that woman is down on the ground, and she is crying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and she raises her hand, she turns to Allah in dua, against you or me, we're in trouble. We're in trouble. We forgot Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. After years of being Imam in Canada, in a community very similar to this in Australia, we found that there were serious problems. And when we opened up the veil and looked behind the veil, behind the thobe, the Jalabiya, behind the Abaya, behind the Kufi, the Khimar, we found something else going on inside of the houses. And we forgot Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there are some cases where we had what can be called today in our community Al Mu'allaqa. The one, the woman who is hanging hanging in between marriage and in between divorce. And there were cases happening over and over again where the brother leaves the house, he might abuse his wife, he doesn't pay the rent, he doesn't do the nafaqah, he's not paying anything, and then he says, I, I won't take care of her, but I won't divorce her. And she will stay in that condition until Yom al -Qiyama. Where did you get this from? I found out, and I say this to myself, I say it with all sincerity. Because we have to speak Qawlan Sadida. The Yahud, the Orthodox Yahud, to wear the locks. They have a practice in their teachings that no separation can come about in any way unless the man himself pronounces divorce. No matter what he does, no matter what happens, he must pronounce it. And somehow, even though we have been oppressed by them, this thinking has drifted into our minds. Because some men think that the only way the marriage will be separated is if they themselves say it. But the Prophet ﷺ has established the khula, and there is a way for the woman to pay back the dowry and to come out of it. There is also fesk, there is a cancellation, where the imam can step in, and when oppression is done, when abuse is done, he stays away for a period of time, different uh, uh, sayings of the, uh, of, of the uh, imma, 
whether it be four months or six months or one year, he stays away. He is in mean. He can't fulfill his, his, his sexual duty. And so the imam could step in and separate that marriage without his permission. And that is agreed upon by all of the scholars of fiqh. And that is clearly within the sunnah of the Prophet And then this thing of talaq. They use talaq. And this talaq comes out of the mouth like water. They get angry then talaq, talaq. They do anything talaq. It keeps pouring out the mouth. When the Prophet ﷺ, whenever this talaq is coming up, he becomes angry. It's ignorance. You call it a number of times, it's jahiliyyah. You're in a state of ignorance if you're using this. It is a serious statement. If you say it jokingly, it's serious. If you say it's serious, it's serious. I don't even the word. But yet, it's used for a type of blackmail to be put over the heads of people. To keep them in fear. Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu an has informed us, Wallahi inna kunna fil jahiliya ma na'uddu lil nisa'i amra hatta anzal Allahu ma anzal wa qassam Allahunna ma qassam. Muttafaqun alayhi. Umar reports, by Allah, we were in ignorance. And we did not give women any rights until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed what He revealed and divided up for them what he divided up. Our original sources of Islam, our original revelation was liberation of all people. And in the case of women, no ideology, no political movement, no army, no civilization, no culture, has ever given women rights on the ground like Islam gave. Women were being buried alive, the young girls were being killed in infancy. There was no rights. Women were chattel in all societies, including European society. They were slaves. They could be bought and sold. They had no rights, they could be killed. And then when Islam came, it gave them equal rights under the law. It also showed clearly that a woman has a soul. Now this might sound strange. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, Kullu nafsin bima kasabat rahina. Every soul will be held responsible for its deeds. Now that might sound strange. Why are we saying that women have a soul? We understand that, but the Christian church in the 20th century was asked, do women have souls? And many of the priests and ministers said, no. They're soulless creatures. Up until the 20th century. Islam also gave property rights to women. That she can have her, her, her own property. That the mahar, this dowry, which is supposed to be an amount of wealth that has some meaning to it. Not necessarily something just symbolic. Not a trifling thing, not a bribe for the father. But something which is of meaning. That is the property of the woman. And Islam established these property rights. And so, up until today, she has the right to her own property. And she has the right for her own bank account. She doesn't have to put her money in her husband's account. This sounds strange, brothers. <laughs> oh no, they marry her, they say, oh darling, you know, we're in love, put your money in my account. Uh-uh. <laughs> she has the right for her own account. Some people didn't know that. She has the right to her own property. That's her property. She's supposed to have power and the ability to do things on her own. And if something happens, la samaha Allah, and there is a separation, this property that she has gives her independence, economic independence. So she's not totally dependent on a man. This is what Islam gave long before women's liberation movement. 
It also said she doesn't have to take the name of her husband. She keeps her own family name. She has her own father and her own mother. Now yes, we are in western countries and sometimes this laqab or whatever it is uh, for the name of the tribe or the qabila, the people take it. But the reality is, the constant stress in this is on independence. That these are two individuals who are married together, zawjain. When zawj is being used, it is a companion. It's not just husband and wife. Like they say in English, husband and wife, like slave, master and slave. It is Zawjain, two companions who complement each other, whose qualities should not be struggling and fighting against each other, but should be complementing each other. We forgot Allah. Even in the Islamic movement, a phenomenon has happened where many of the brothers feel that the more they're committed to Islam is the more they should suppress their wife. Lock her up, shut her up. Don't have her involved. Hide her away. Crush her intellect. And they think that this is Islamic. And I'm not talking about the separation which is a natural thing in Islam. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave the rights of education to the women. We didn't give it to them. And even what has happened in America, that there are in the case of some African Americans, and it happens to other people too who are entering into Islam, where the woman during the period of slavery was the building block, she was the center of the whole family. Most of the people in the slavery and apartheid periods didn't even know their father. Because the slavery was killing the men, imprisoning the men, making them drink alcohol, destroying them. But yet the person accepts Islam and then tries to belittle women, tries to put them down when it was a woman who taught him almost everything he knew until he left the house to go to school. And even then, he had to fall back on his mother, not only for his emotional needs, but sometimes for his physical needs, his financial needs, all of his needs, his protection. Because in many cases, she was the man and the woman of the house. So how now can we enter Islam and you put her down? This is not what Islam is saying to us. That is not the early generation. It is liberation, it is freedom from slavery to human beings. To the slavery to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if we become a servant and a slave of Allah, then nobody and nothing should put us down. And the Prophet ﷺ said very clear, لَا تَعَى لِلْمَخْلُوبِ مَعْسِيَةِ الْخَالِقِ There is no obedience to the creation when the creation disobeys Allah. There is no obedience. And so, we have to reanalyze the concept of separation. I want to speak straightforward to you, because I feel in my heart that you have the opportunity, inshallah, to take Islam to all parts of this island, to take Islam all around Southeast Asia, to be a beacon of strength for the whole of Southeast Asia. We have this potential insha'Allah. But what has happened to us, in some cases we have created second class citizens. And if separation means that in one side you have first class treatment, and on the other side of the veil it's second class treatment, then that is what we call in South Africa apartheid. It is apartheid. It is not the Islamic concept of separation where the men and women equally listen to the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, where they learn Islam equally in different areas. That is the Islamic concept. In many cases we have conferences, I've experienced conferences. On the brother's side, they're talking about fiqh, aqidah, tafsir, nahu and saraf. 
They're going deep into Islamic history. On the sister's side, how do you cook Islamic cooking? <laughs> or they say, what are the rights of men and the obligation of women? Not the rights of women. What are the obligations? In some Muslim countries, you come into the masjid, and on the men's side, the rug is clean, it is nice. On the woman's side, the fleas are jumping all over the place, and the roof is falling in. And one of the things, when I was traveling in Morocco, Al Maghrib, that I love so much about the masjid, that the women's section had the same wudu area, and the same rugs as the men's section. And they can enjoy the salat. It didn't have to be even in the same area. But they could enjoy the salat. They could make wudu. They had their entrance. They could pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if they were outside with their family. And so, separation should not be marginalization. There's a difference between the two. And so we need to be honest with ourselves and to look into this dilemma that we are in, this crisis. It is a challenge. Look at it in a positive way. Because we can change the society. If a woman is educated, then the whole family is educated. You educate the man, you educate the individual. You educate the mother and you're educating the children. But if the mother is afraid of the masjid, if she feels negative about Islam, then how can the children love Islam? If the Prophet ﷺ has given certain rights to women, how can we take it away? And so we need to look at this in a serious way. Number one, we all need to increase our taqwa especially the brothers. And I say this with all sincerity because we have a big task on our shoulders. We have a mighty task. And the Sahaba were Mujahideen in the daytime and they were bad. They were praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the night. They feared nobody and nothing. And they would speak out when you had to speak out. And if it was time to go forward, and the enemy was there ten times their size, then they would look at each other, they would turn around and look at each other. And in the battle of Mu'ta, when they were facing the enemy and the huge Roman army, and the great Sahaba, Jalai ibn Ruwaha, radiallahu anhu, and many of them, they look and they said, did we come here to live? Or did we come here to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Why did we come to this place? To hold on to the dunya. So we have a mighty task upon our backs. And if the sisters are empowered to take this message and to stand in back of the men and to hold the rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then inshallah we can have that type of structure that will not be quaking when it's under pressure. Although when the ego and the nafs gets involved, when tribalism comes in, when organizational fanaticism comes in, and so you see people fighting against each other, and you will see in some of the Muslim countries where the men are the most intolerant to the women, see how they act with themselves. You see how they act with themselves. You mark my words. Look at the countries where the men are the most intolerant to women. Don't even want to see them then watch how they deal with each other. They can't agree on anything. Their ego comes in in a minute. And when another man opposes them, they try to kill him. Why are they like that? They need some water to put out their fire. In many cases, the presence of a woman, her opinion in matters, the thought of the families, when we are making our decisions for the communities, it waters down the flame. It waters the flames down. When the natives in America would build settlements and would make a decision in their shura, they would say, 
what would happen three generations from now. They didn't plan just for now. What will happen three generations from now if we build a house on the right side of the stream? Because they were thinking about their families. They were thinking about the future. They were thinking about their nation. Not just their ego and their movement and their reputation. So we need to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Secondly, we need to focus more on character, on akhlaq. We have focused heavily on ibadah, on how to make the salah, how to fast in Ramadan. The Prophet ﷺ has told us, بُعِثْتُ لِأُتَمِّمَ مَكَارَمَ الْأَخْلَاقِ And we find this in Al-Mawatta, that he said, I have been sent in order to complete the best part of character. That's why I've been sent. It's the character. And so we need to focus more on character, on akhlaq when we are dealing with the sunnah. Also, interpersonal relationships. How did the Prophet ﷺ deal with other people? How was the Muslim committed, but yet he was humble? He was strong against the disbelievers. Humble to the believers. Easy to forgive. Easy to forgive. Wanting unity. Wanting peace inside of himself. Will reach out to other people. That's our character. Forgive other Muslims. Make, make, close our ranks. Make unity whenever we can. The enemies of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are marching on us. And they're planning day and night. And so we need to focus more on interpersonal relationships. How the Prophet ﷺ dealt with his family. How Muslims deal with each other. Number three, a change in concepts of manhood and womanhood. What is manhood in Islam? What is womanhood in Islam? There is a concept, there is a wrong concept we have about leadership. This idea of an Amir. What does Amir mean? What does the President mean? If you become the Ra'is, or you are Mudir, or you are the Amir, you are the Imam, what is the concept of leadership in Islam? In many cases, we have a problem. Because it's, it's a concept of hierarchy. And so you have hierarchy versus cooperation. In the concept of hierarchy, the leader is above everybody else. He has privileges. He looks down and gives orders. And the more names that you get and titles that you get is the more worth you think you have. The more money that you think you deserve. This is a concept of hierarchy. And it influences not only our organizations, but it also influences our families. On the other side is cooperation. It is complementing, that our, our Muslim, the Muslims complement each other. And it is said that the Prophet ﷺ was a humble person. And when the people used to hear about his reputation, and they would come to Medina, they would be trembling, they would be afraid. But when they met him, they never wanted to leave him. On one occasion, the person came in and looked at the circle, and he said, which one of you is Rasulullah Which one of you? Like he couldn't see, he was not on the throne. He was not special to people, he would come in the room, and the people would stand up. And he would say, sit down. And he would shake their hands sitting down. What do our leaders do today in the Muslim world? He wants to travel from his office to another building and the police are lining the road two days before. <laughs> because he wants to go from one office to another office. And he flies by. Or he comes inside the masjid, he wants to make Juma so everybody can see that he's making Salat and they won't overthrow him. And so they kick people out the way. Let him pray. This is not Rasulullah a humble person. But when the revelation came, 
When it was time for the command, all eyes were upon him. People wanted to do everything that he was doing. Even how he moved his hand, how he, how he wore his clothes, how he ate his food. They wanted to do everything like him. They loved him that much. So cooperation, the leader is the most responsible person. That's what the leader really is. He's the one who should be thinking at night about the Jama'at when everybody's sleeping. He goes in the front lines. Rasulullah many of the battles, and Hudaybiyah especially, we see when the Muslims were attacked, they were surprised. And the battle was hot, Muslims were dying. And the Sahaba would say, when the battle got hot, we could see their eyes, we could smell them. We took refuge in Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa We took refuge in him. In the heat of the battle, he was there. Not way in the back somewhere, but he was there, suffering as his followers suffered. This is true leadership. And so hierarchy on one side, and cooperation on the other side. How does this affect our homes? This is a key problem. And if we can overcome this concept, and implement this concept, I believe, a lot of the problems that we have in our families would be solved. Or at least we could see the light at the end of the tunnel. It's cooperation. So the Amir of the house, the man is the leader of the house. And he is the Amir. But what does the Amir mean? He's not supposed to be a dictator. He takes shura with his family. And if his wife is correct, then he says, Alhamdulillah, you're correct. But in some cases, that doesn't happen. Man. Everything he says, you saman wa ta I told you. He calls home and he says, I want roti. No rice. Boom. She doesn't have any, any flour to cook the roti, man. And so the rice is cooking and he comes in, A'udhu billah, you disobeyed me. Is that disobedience to the Amir? She had to make a decision. But it goes that far. It goes that far. Never forget, and one of the great scholars in West Africa, Sheikh Uthman Danfodio, Rahimahullah, he said to the women of Hausaland, and this is unprecedented what he did. He was faqih in the Maliki fiqh. He was half of the Quran. He was a master of tafsir. A master of hadith. Did dawah for 30 years in the field. He had 1,000 students. By the time the 30 years was over, whenever he traveled from one place to another, a thousand students traveled with him. The king became jealous of him and called him to the court and aimed the gun at him, his courtier, aimed the gun and it backfired and killed the courtier. The Shaykh Rahimahullah receded. He receded. And he made hijrah, just like the Prophet ﷺ. Then he took bayah. The Prophet ﷺ came to him in a dream and gave him the sword of truth and told him, take it forward. And then they opened up 250,000 square kilometers. And they ruled with Sharia for over a hundred years to the coming of the British. 250,000 square kilometers. This is fiqh in action. This is a scholar who now his students became the governors of the areas. And he wrote to them in classical Arabic language. What did he say to the women? He told them, if your husband will not educate you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said you're supposed to be educated, you disobey him. I will have a circle every day after Asa. If they don't educate you in the home, you come out. Why? Why do you say this, Ibn Fudi? Qala alayhi salatu wasalam, la ta'a lil makhluq fi ma'asiyat al there is no obedience to the creation when that creation disobeys Allah. And it's happening to us. We had a case of a brother, and I'm talking reality now. We want to feel good, I'm a little light sometimes, because this is really a sad you know, story. 
the whole thing. But this was happening really. One brother, he accepted Islam, and then he got married to the sister. He was a good brother, you know, a very hands-on type of brother. She was, from, she was a college student. And so she began to study hadith, memorize the Qur'an. And then whenever they got into an argument, she brought the hadith, she brought dalil. She gave him the dalil. And so finally he said, I, your husband, don't study anymore. I prohibit you from studying. And he ran in the room and tried to study the hadith. <laughs> That's not the way, brother. That's not the way, man. Because if she knows the hadith, that's going to save you from the fire. She, she's going to save you from the fire. So cooperation. Cooperation. If we see the qualities of a woman, the qualities of the man. And I say this also to the sisters as well. Because it's not just the problem with the brothers. It can be the problem with the woman as well in the home. Her husband makes a mistake. He loses his job. He's in a weak condition. And how does she deal with him then? Does she support him? In some cases she looks at him and says, You little boy. <laughs> Look at you. You can't earn money. You're a shame and disgrace to, to manhood. How does he feel? She makes him feel so low. She knows his secrets, right? What did Khadija radiallahu anha do? When the Prophet ﷺ came back from the mountain, and he, he was trembling, this thing had come to him and said, Iqra, Iqra. He didn't know what it was. A power beyond human imagination. He was trembling and shaking. She covered him up. She didn't belittle him. She believed in him. And she used her wisdom. Went to her cousin Waraqa. And so she strengthened Islam. She was the first to believe. This is what we know of Muslim women. But not to put the man down. Not to find his weaknesses and constantly be on his back, talking against him and putting him down, and then expecting him to treat you right. It's not going to work like that. It has to be cooperation. The two sides cooperate with each other. They have strength, like a football team. One is in the middle, the big guys. The other ones run on the side, throw the ball. Everybody cooperates. That is the Islamic family. And if we could understand that, then the whole, all the concepts and problems we have, who's the leader of the house, who will make the decision, who will get this in inheritance, all of these things come clear when we see that Allah has given us if he has given a man an advantage, it's not because he's a higher human being. It's because he's going to have more responsibility. And he, is, he will be answerable on the day of resurrection. Another suggestion is that we develop special institutions and support mechanisms for the protection, education, and empowerment of Muslim women and also anybody who has serious problems in our community. And I want to uh, uh, give you this concept and also uh, uh, pledge myself, inshallah, in the future if needs to be to come and deal with workshops in this area. Right? That, that we need a new institution that happens. And this developed, is developed in Canada and now it's spreading all over America now. It's a social service organization. Because what I found after years of being Imam, five years of the biggest mosque in Toronto, most of the problems that were coming were not problems in fiqh. It was not aqidah problems. They weren't asking me these questions. They had economic problems, psychological problems, social problems, all kinds of things they would come with. And, and so I needed to have somebody with me. I wasn't qualified. I wasn't prepared to do this. And what happens in many communities, and I can see it happening here, there's a few sincere individuals, they start handling social problems, and suddenly the whole world is on their back, and you, they get burnt out. Because there's only so much you can take as, a, as an individual. And the emotion that will come into you from dealing with, with, with social problems, we need training. 
And so we established this center. We established a hotline. A telephone line that people could call when they were in crisis. And after two years, we were receiving 5,000 phone calls per year. And registering it. And we opened up the office like a doctor's office. The Imams cooperate with the doctors, with the lawyers, with the social workers, with the psychiatrists. And we make a list, we have a database of all of the Muslim professionals in our area. So if a person has a drug related problem, then we find the Muslims who have been involved in detox. If a person has a psychological problem, then phone a Muslim psychiatrist. If a person has an economic problem, we have a brother who's working in the government. We have another one who's an accountant. The person has a, a, a legal problem. There are Muslim lawyers. You have a list, you have a data bank of information. And so when the hotline, when, when you answer the phone, the person is trained to deal with crisis. It's a crisis. People are calling in. You're trained to deal with the crisis. And then you either put them on to somebody else, or you bring them into the office, and the social worker works along with the imam. And so Sharia is the limits, it sets the limits. We don't go outside of the limits of Islam, but also we benefit from the best professionalism that is in our community. And so we handled counseling, uh, we handled family problems, youth problems, housing, marriage, abuse problems. So many problems of abuse behind the veil. We also gave people referrals. We referred to immigration problems, housing, social assistance, legal problems, shelters, food banks, employment centers, health, Muslim community resources. We, we got the, the green book. We had set up with all the resources in the community. Also education. We had classes for deaf Muslims, hearing impaired. Because you may have some hearing impaired Muslims. And what we developed, and this is another level which, which I make a, 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 as a suggestion, when we had a speaker come, we would have a signer standing right here. And the deaf Muslims would sit uh, uh, there near the signer, he would listen and he would do the signs. So they would get the lecture also. And there are many hearing impaired Muslims that need to hear the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Also guidance counselors, education, Islamic heritage, dawa classes, training and development, burial services. Also community development. Our, our, our community is in, in crisis or in the midst of, of a society in crisis. So we need to have discussions and programs along with our fiqh and our aqidah, anti-violence, health, anti-racism. Youth employment, cons consultation, recreation, youth development, camps develop out of this, workshops, training think programs for the youth. And so we, 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 we developed this institution to empower the community. And sisters need to be empowered. Not only just reading the books, but sisters need to have skills. And when we are involved in education, we naturally continue to practice our Islam. We wear our clothing, we are modest, male and female, and if we have to sacrifice our Islam, then we're not going to be involved. But if we can go out and get the education, then we need it for our community. Sisters need to be empowered with skills, with education, also even physical training. The sisters need physical training as well. Now that might sound strange to you, but you know what happened to us in Toronto? We had a rapist, and he only raped Muslim women. Uzi Billah in the Shaitan regime, a devil out of hell. Only followed the women with with a skit with with scarf. Okay, so then we trained the sisters. So the sisters started to take what they call wendo, a soft form of self-defense, wendo. And so when she finished the course. She broke a board and it said Zainab broke this board on April 22nd, 2001. 
And she went home and put it over her bed. And the next time her husband was about to hit her, he looked at the board. And he said, MashaAllah, Tabarakallah, MashaAllah. And then he remembered the ayah. وَأَمْرُهُمْ شُورَ بَيْنَهُمْ And their affairs are handled in mutual consultation. And so it empowered the sisters. Alhamdulillah, they caught the rapists. They got them. Threw them in jail. But the sisters realized then they were empowered. And they needed this. It's part of the Islamic personality. They are attacking people with hijab in other countries. I don't know if it's happening yet. I don't believe it's happening yet. But in France and in Quebec, in Canada and other parts, you can be attacked on the street if you are wearing the scarf. And so it is happening in Western countries. And it will eventually come forward. The stronger the Muslim world gets and the weaker the, the Western world gets. And so we need to be empowered. We need to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we need to close our ranks. And I leave you, I say this to myself with all sincerity. اِتَّقُوا دَعْوَةُ الْمَظْلُومِ فَلَيْسَ بَيْنَهَا وَبَيْنَ اللَّهِ hijab. Fear the dua or the call of the oppressed. There is no barrier in between that and Allah. And I ask the sisters to forgive us. Forgive us. We don't know what we're doing. I ask the brothers... If you are on the right path, alhamdulillah. If you have made a mistake, we need to make tawbah. And we need to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have mercy on us and, and to empower our families and to give us the strength to stand up to this tidal wave of kufr that is growing in the society today. I leave you with these words and I ask Allah to forgive me and forgive you. Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullahi wa lakum wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.